The next hour I'd like to talk about the cell processor. And first I have to make a, a warning and second I have to give you a disclaimer because first the warning, this is going to be a technical talk. So everybody who's not expecting a technical, net technical talk and does not know about an assembler is, uh, I think you, you won't enjoy it. So <laughs> the second fact, the disclaimer, it's uh, mainly about that I didn't invent a cell processor. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe. It's invented by uh, this STI consortium. And yes, all these facts I'm naming are available on the net. And I, I hope I'm not going to tell anything else because I signed the NDA, NDA with IBM. And yeah, we'll see. <laughs> OK, so just one sentence to my background. I'm working in the, uh, at the Technical University of Chemnitz in the Department of Computer Science, uh, Chair of Computer Architecture. For, uh, we are caring for scientific computing and calculating all kinds of scientific problems, for example, quantum mechanics, and try to accelerate these calculations. So the cell processor will be great for this task. But I think you are not very interested in uh, scientific computations. You're interested in other kinds of computations, for example, computing keys or computing yeah, certificates and all this stuff. And I think you can be quite sure the cell processor will also compute keys if you want it. And very fast. So to my outline, uh, basically there are five points, four are on these slides. One is a demonstration. So sorry, the demonstration is just a simulation because the cell processor is not yet on the mass market. And yeah, but there's a simulator provided by IBM which can be downloaded by everybody and I try to, to show you a very small example of the power of the cell processor. I hope that we have time at the end, but we'll see. So the first point is general vision. It's a short introduction. Why is cell pro processor? Uh, why are we going to do this new approach? Why aren't we sticking with the x86 architecture? Or at least why is IBM doing this? Um, the second one is, is the whole part, uh, the main part of my talk, it's the cell architecture. That's going to be hardware details and how you can leverage these hardware details for your specific task of maybe yeah, computing some keys or something. I don't know. Uh, the third point is, is very, very short one because the cell programming is basically um, up to you. So I can't tell you what you're doing with the cell, but I can tell, I can tell you about the architecture and you can yeah, experiment and program your own programs and run them on a simulator and yeah, if you have the cell, then you can run them on the real cell. Okay, the fourth is just a summary and the fifth one, um, if I have time, the simulation. Okay, the, basically the research started in 2000, so I think many of you know. So Sony, Toshiba and IBM founded a new research group to develop a new kind of processor. It's uh, basically called STI, Sony, Toshiba, and IBM, this consortium. Um, so every member of it brought something special. So Sony brought the PS2 architecture, which is also very interesting, but unfortunately supports only single precision calculation. And so for scientific calculations, not very suitable, uh, suitable because scientific calculations use and uh, needs double precision, yeah, you know. Um, Toshiba has, has memory experience and they're producing uh, memory chips and these uh, RAM bus and they need chips for their TVs, for HDTV. If you've ever been to Japan, for example, everything is HDTV there and it's, it's very compute intensive and so you need these chips, new chips, to cheap new chips. Um, IBM has technical knowledge in processor manufacturing, of course, I don't have to tell you. They invented nearly everything <laughs> through so this out-of-order execution, this Tomasulo logic, so cache reuse, um, yeah, everything. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's another thing. For example, it's also very interesting that the cell design or approach maybe is very old it's by, yeah, Cray. <laughs> okay, but it wasn't copied. It's, it's brought, they brought it to a new level, but well, I'll come to this later. Okay, but Altogether, they invested billions of dollars. That's really a big investment. They made a totally new research facility and built up everything from scratch. And 
Yeah, they wanted to propose a high throughput multi-purpose processor. High throughput because of this new multimedia design. So everybody wants to support multimedia and this HDTV and all this stuff. And for uh, of course video games. So that's also things where you need very high throughput. Yep. And you have several problems with current architectures to support these high throughput. Yeah. This is, for example, the memory latency bandwidth gap of the von Neumann principle. It's a very huge problem. You, you can't get around it. You would just have to invent a new architecture to, to get around it. And that's basically this thing. Um, you have this instruction latency gap, which is very funny because an instruction just gets into the processor and needs very long time to, to be actually processed because you have all this control logic which cares for your out of order execution and this Tomazulu logic inside the processor for reordering the um, single instructions for getting getting them faster or finding some parallelism in these, inside these instructions. That's mainly about this out of order execution. They try to find parallelism for the, uh, in the instructions to yeah, compute them in, in parallel. And, but this adds an instruction latency because the through, uh, throughput is higher. Uh, it's basically much higher, but the latency is also higher. So a single instruction needs more clock cycles to get through the whole processor. Yeah, and then the old-fashioned x86 architectures is going to be a problem itself. <laughs> For example, yeah, just remember the A20 gate. Yeah, I don't need to add anything else. Um, then we have this implicit mem hierarchy. That's also very interesting. Is it a problem or not? It was designed to help. So it was designed to help programmers to get faster access to memory to these, I'm talking of these uh, layer one and layer two caches. Um, but actually, now the programmers are designing for this implicit things. So you're trying to imagine what the hardware will do with your code, and you're optimizing for the specific hardware. So that's that's quite ugly. You could optimize if you if you have direct access to it. You could optimize in a better way. You don't have to optimize with several assumptions what it's going to do with my code and reordering. But yeah, basically, it's you, we can discuss very long if it's a problem or not. So I had this discussion with my professor, and it yeah took a very long time. And then we have the longest path. That's basically to determine how how fast my processors can can be clocked. So if my longest path, so the longest pipeline stage is very long, I, I have to reload. So we have to imagine that we have to uh, reload every electrons to and from all these transistors into this longest path. And either we take a, a very huge uh, yeah, voltage to, to put them through, but maybe it will burn, or we just um, we just introduce a longer pipeline, a deeper pipeline with very small pipeline stages, and we can shorten shorten the longest path. Basically, yes, that's what Intel did, and we see it's yeah, it's not the best architecture, the NetPost architecture with 20 pipeline stages. Yeah, 30, okay, <laughs> maybe more. We don't know, um, and then. That's the, the most important fact. What are we going to do with these millions of transistors we have? Every year, uh, every 18 months, uh, according to uh, Moore's law, the, transistor, the number of transistors doubles. And so what are we going to do with these transistors? We can put more functionality and more and more, more functionality, but the problem is to put more, fun the, the CPU isn't getting faster with this more functionality. The CPU is just, uh, staying at the same speed, maybe we can introduce more parallelism. But this is also limited. The instruction parallelism is limited. So this Tomazulu logic doesn't scale to infinite. And our problem is that we, we want to scale to infinite, but we can't do this on a very fine-grained level. So we have to go a level up. That's what I, what I am going to tell you on the next slide, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, what can we do? Or what, what did we do? until now with the, all these transistors, because mm, Moore's law basically has been there since a couple of decades. And yeah, we introduced this superscalar architecture and this Tomazulu logic, which is responsible for trying to find an, an out of order execution, of course, trying to find um, instruction level parallelism, this called ILP, the uh, buzzword. And 
yes, trying to, to leverage it to increase the overall throughput of, our, of my CPU. So I think everybody is doing this today. It's done by Intel, it's done by AMD, and of course IBM. And yeah, the second point was to introduce speculative execution so that we have two branches. Just try to take, a, I think you all know about this. I'm just going to repeat it <laughs> very short. And um, two branches take both and just discard any uh, calculations done in the wrong branch when we know the branch decision. So we have hyper and deep pipelining. That's also very interesting. So just two pipelines and these pipelines are processed in parallel. It's just another kind of parallelism. What we see, it's basically about parallelism. Everybody tries to find parallelism, but the processor is on a very, very, very uh, low level. So the processor sees only the single instructions and the single instructions uh, he has to find the parallelism inside these single instructions, and that's going to be a problem, because as I told you, that's that's limited. If you're usually programming, you you can do yeah five, six instructions in parallel, but a normal code doesn't allow this. And as first, uh, third, fourth, you <laughs> introduced virtual memory and caches. That's yeah what I mentioned in the slide before, and now we will we are going to see did it pay off. Did it help us to to improve the overall speed of a CPU? Yeah, I have to say partially, because yeah, the first thing we re uh, we reached was high throughput and high clock speed. Very easy. Introducing pipelining. Pipelining is also a concept of parallel parallelizing some architecture. So you basically have uh, more than one pipeline stage, and they they are just uh, computing in parallel and th just processing it. So we shorten the longest path because we just divide it by n for n pipeline stages. To say very easy, it's more complicated of course. But and we need buffers between these pipeline stages. Yeah, that's going to to cost us transistors. So to introduce this new technology, we have to invest transistors. But the overall estimation is that we have we reach pipelining, we have very high clock rates, but the problem which are problems which are arising are actually the pipeline effects. So you have different hazards in a pipeline. There are structural hazards, there are data hazards, and there are some more hazards, but basically the structural hazards are very easy to, to overcome. So you could just yeah, introduce two dual port RAM or something, but the, the data hazards, they will stay. And also the third kind of hazard, the code and control hazard, will also stay. What can you do? To avoid the control hazard is going to speculative execution. So you're just doing what I told you. So you're calculating two branches and discard the branch which is going to, to be wrong. And um, yeah, basically this is done by the Itanium processor, the speculative execution. But I don't know any processor which is doing this else. But Maybe you can tell me more about this. Um, yeah, we see Pat Gelsinger is one of the Intel guys, which is the, is the chief technology officer. We uh, how to say uh, proposed Gelsinger's law. Gelsinger's law basically says that the doubling doubling the amount of transistors is actually increasing the performance only by one, but one dot four. So just Check Google for Gelsinger's law, and you will find this. Um, I think that's a kind of unofficial, but it's it really says what I'm going to tell you. So we we can double the transistors. We can introduce more and more logic, but we won't find more parallelism in the code. The code is as it, as it is, and so this parallelism isn't there. And yeah, what are the processor guys going to do? Yeah, just move it up. So we are building a process, so we don't find any uh, any parallelism in the code. Just okay, let's let's move the problem to the programmer. Let's let the programmer think about parallelism and trying to parallelize things, and that's what they are actually doing today. So they're introducing multi-core. Everybody knows if I have a multi-core, my computer doesn't get any faster. It just has two cores, two processors, and I have to care of it to make it faster. I have to program. Parallel codes, or okay, I can run two programs, but <laughs> yeah, that's a very stupid approach. Um, I have to parallelize my code to make it run faster, and yeah, I have to find it. So, so they just moved the problem up to me. But the funny thing is, 
these multicore is also not very nice because inside this multicore we have again these um, um, this logic, this Tomasulu logic, this out of order execution logic, which drops down my usage uh, efficiency of the transistors. So we have to think in transistors or in, in chip size and die size. That's basically what we are going to do. We're paying die size when we are buying a transistor because it costs nothing to put, uh, buying a processor, sorry. It costs nothing to put transistors on a die, but the die size costs. And yeah, what are they going to do now? The easy approach is multicore. Yeah, that's everybody does this. Intel, AMD, of course, AMD first, then Intel. Um, the second approach is vector processing. I think that's a very old thing. Vector processing was done by the by Cray, and I think that the first Cray was a, a vector processor. And it looks a little bit like the cell processor if we, yeah, look at it, but. Um, the cell processor takes it to the next level. So we have vector units which are going to um, accelerate our code, but we have to care for programming them. And yeah, the, basically the same thing as SIMD. We all know that's being in the commercials since yeah, two years. The LTVEC or MMX or SSE or SSE2 or SSE3 or some more SSE. So we are extending the um, the uh, Command set, so the instruction set, the, the ISA instruction set architecture, for uh, with new instructions which are vectorizing our code. So again, the programmer has to find it. There's currently no real compiler. Which okay, they they're trying to to develop some, but I didn't see a really good compiler which uh, really finds vectorizable code in in some random program. They're just these mathematical programs which are very easy to randomize, uh, to vectorize because, <laughs> because they are not random. They're like do loops and yeah, it's, it's very easy to find a vector inside a do loop because yeah, it's just a do loop. Um, we can introduce more registers. That's also very interesting. So if I have more registers, I have basically a, a bigger working set. The processor is working on registers, at least in a load store, in a clean load store architecture. And I think, most of our processors, our current processors, are load store architectures. They seem that they're x86, this ugly, you, know, you can operate in memory and you can operate on anything else. But yeah, they're translating it. So they have two layers and they have an outer layer and then an inner layer, which is a risk. And the outer layer is just receiving all these high level x86 commands, translating it into multiple small commands and operating on it in, on internal registers. and something like this, but you have to ask Intel or AMD for this, I don't know. Um, we can introduce explicit SRAM, which is basically the same as more registers, but it's cheaper. So SRAM is not, uh, we can introduce bigger amounts of SRAM, we'll see, that that is, we'll see this at the uh, cell processor, they have a big amount of SRAM, but only, okay, very small amount, it's, it's not small, we'll see. Um, Yes, but it's 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 explicit cache. So it's it's not cache is something you don't see. Bless you. <laughs> cache is something you you don't see. It's it's like um, it's just working magically for you. It's it's finding your access. It's using your locality principle for you without managing it or without mentioning it. But this explicit SRAM is just like an, a, a scratch board for you, a scratch space where you can program, which you can using by programming or which the, the compiler can use. Yes, yes. Okay, and then, then we can add GPU parallelism. So we all know that the GPUs, of the today's GPUs are, are highly parallel because a task of rendering an image is highly parallel, it's implicit. So from x86 to the future, that's a, a question mark <laughs> because I'm not sure about this. But I, I think the risk design is way to go because it's easy and it can be very fast. We can clock risk processors up to several gigahertz, up to 10 gigahertz with no problems because they're very easy. The CISC design is, is not that way, but I'm not sure. It depends. The risk design just moves the complexity into the upper layer, into the software. We have to care about programming it and the, uh, the CISC design just tries to manage everything in hardware. So that's a basic, uh, yeah 
basic basic difference. Um, we are going to have in-order CPUs because this out-of-order principle is quite nice to find instruction-level parallelism, but we pay a high price for this. Um, we need all this Thomas Ulu logic, reservation stations, and all this additional hardware we don't need without it. And actually, Intel did a very interesting, uh, I don't want to say experiment, but yes, this Itanium architecture, you all know. Um, maybe. Maybe somebody thinks, or maybe most of you think that it's dead, but I don't think so, because it's, it's a very interesting architecture. The only mistake they did was to introduce it without a background. So the cell is the same. We are going a new way. We are destroying most of the compatibility and going a new way, in a new direction, but we have a background, or they have a background, IBM, Sony, and Toshiba, because they have PlayStation. <laughs> that's what it's going about, and that's going to be a, a big success because, yeah, many people will buy PlayStation, but how many people will buy a servers, a servers with itanium processors? Okay, he, he said that it's uh, HP UX is available for itanium, right. and yeah, that's going to, to be better, I think. But we'll see. I'm not sure because it's just too expensive this processor yet. And okay, then we have a system on chip design, which everybody is going a system on chip design because basically two cores on a single chip is a system on chip. And then we can support heterogeneous multiprocessing. Okay, but I have to go on that you can see the uh, the demonstration later on. Um, the cell architecture, first patented by Ken Kudaragi. Uh, in 1999, uh, it's the, uh, I think, the CEO of Sony, and he has a, a vision. That's a very, uh, very visionary vision. It's very far away, and just look the, uh, look at this. You have different devices, and you have hardware cells, which is basically a processor processing a software cell. And a software cell is just like a small task. So you, you want to do something, you pack it into a small packet and send it somewhere in the net and it will come back processed for you. And yeah, so floating software cells, I, I think that's written in the patent. And yeah, that's what's on this slide. But we are not in this way, not yet. We'll see if this will come. But maybe, yes, these software cells will be controlled by the government or something, and we are able to process them by ourselves. Um, the cell processor is actually a heterogeneous multiprocessor consisting of, of nine cores. And these nine cores uh, have a, many abbreviations. So I just want to introduce these abbreviations that you can follow me later on, because it's going to be yeah, very abbreviative. Um, the SPU is the synergistic processing unit. So you all know what synergistic means, I think. It's, it's a very funny thing, but I, d I don't know why they call it synergistic. But the second thing is the memory flow controller. So an SPU plus a memory, uh, plus a memory flow controller is a SPE. It's a synergistic processing element. That's basically eight of these nine cores. And then we have an additional power processing element called PPE. Uh, that's the old legacy thing inside this processor, which keeps up compatibility to the other, to the outer world. So it's it's just running anything. Uh, every program which is running on a PPC 970 is running on a cell processor without without any change because it has a, this power processing element on it, and it just can process the yeah the application as normal. And yet, yeah, put everything together, we have a cell processor and. These are nine full-blown CPUs. So we buy one processor, and we have nine CPUs. And this processor is not going to be very expensive. So basically, I think this PlayStation will be the cheapest thing to buy a cell processor. But I'll come to this later. OK, all these uh, elements are connected with the element interconnection bus. And of course, they have a yeah, an I.O. connection to the outer world or to other cell processors or to anything else to just to submit, for example, these uh, software cells to other cell processors. And we have a memory interface controller, which, of course, is uh, interfacing to XDR because, yeah, Toshiba. And, yeah, unfortunately, we have hardware DRM. And we'll see how bad it's going to be. 
uh, I hope we can switch it off. I'm not sure, but because Sony is inside, and I think <laughs> if Sony is able, if Sony is able to put a hardware rootkit into the cell processors, they are going to do it, and that's maybe. Uh, this hardware DRM, and, and so I'm not sure. There's also an, another very funny thing about Sony and the PlayStation, but I'll tell you later. Um, and the interrupt controller basically routes all interrupts just to the PPE, because the PPE is supposed to do all operating system tasks. So, for example, if you're mo moving your mouse, the PPE is processing it. You, it's not processed by any SPU. Um, effective, it's a, a network on chip, of course. And yeah, we have this number. 256 gigaflops inside a processor. But yeah, we'll come to this later also. <laughs> okay, that's how IBM, so source and copyright, copyright IBM, sees the cell processor. Many, many abbreviations, but basically what I told you. We have the element interconnection bus, interconnecting everything, power processing element, memory controller, uh, bus interface controller, the SPU or the SPE. So then we have a synergistic execution unit, of course, everything is synergistic, and a local storage. So there's the first prototype. Um, the first prototype was, of course, produced by IBM, or inside this uh, alliance between Sony, Toshiba, and IBM. It's a 90 nanometer silicon and insulator, and has eight copper layers. It's reminding me of the Opteron, I don't know why. But, and 241 million transistors and a very yeah, small die size we see, 235 <laughs> square millimeters. And it takes only 60 to 80 watts. And that's amazing, I think, for this, um, um, for this power we can get out of it, for this calculation power. And they only enabled six to seven, uh, six to seven SPEs, but okay, that's going to be normal at the beginning of the production process because the yield will, would be very, very low if we would enable all SPEs. It's just like the, um, like Intel does for, uh, like every process of Intel does, for example, if something in the cache is broken, just switch it off and sell it at a cheaper price. So it's going to be a Celeron processor if something in the cache is broken. And yeah, that's what they do. And that's also what maybe happens to the PlayStation, but we'll see. And it supports IBM virtualization technology. Very interesting approach. So we can run multiple uh, operating systems on it simultaneously. Like, you know, maybe Xen, and it's Xen in hardware, or VMware, VMware in hardware. And yeah, it's operated at 1.1 volt and it's able to achieve clock frequencies frequencies higher than 4 gigahertz so the prototypic implementation okay now i'm coming to the interesting thing that's a floor plan of the cell processor i think it's also copyrighted by ibm or somebody but i found it on the net um we have the first thing that's the pbe that's the pbe and that's the layer 2 cache so we see layer 2 cache is quite big and we have to remember Every square millimeter on this floor plan costs money. So it's, it's not about transistors or something, it's about square millimeters. Okay, that's just a, a block diagram. And to say something about the PPE, it's not very interesting because it's a power, uh, it's a power PC compatible and runs every power PC code. It's a dual threaded 64-bit uh, power architecture, of course. And dual threaded, it's this SMT simultaneous multi-threading is like the um, Intel, how's it called, hyper-threading. So it's uh, some virtual, some virtual parallelism inside the processor. Um, it has, of course, the uh, vectorized multimedia extensions and is a simple architecture. That's the biggest difference to the power processors, for example, Power 4 or Power 5, because it, has a, it supports only in-order execution. Why this? We have a very high clock frequency. So we are running these chips at 4 gigahertz. And we can't, and everything is running at 4 gigahertz the PPE, the SPEs, the bus. And yeah, so we need a very simple architecture with a very deep pipeline. So not as deep as the Intel processor, but still 20 pipeline stages is quite, yeah. Yeah, you told me that you did it as 30. 
Okay, the current one, yeah. Yeah, but okay, it, it will have the same problems basically as the Intel, Intel Pentium 4 processor. Um, we have two instructions issue, issued per cycle. It's not very interesting. Split cache, and it's also this is basically the part which supports virtualization. Yeah, that's not supported by the SP, uh, SPEs or something. It's supported by the PPE, of course. Um, yeah, to say overall, it's a simplified power architecture to run at these high frequencies. Um, the synergistic processing element is the thing the, which is interesting at the processor, at the whole cell processor, because we have eight of it. It's a very small processing element, but it's just the amount which counts. We also see that it's occupying most of the, altogether, most of the floor plan. And yeah, it's connected with the EIB. And each of it is a fully blown vector CPU. So it has own RAM, SRAM. It's not a cache, so it's, it does the difference between RAM and cache, you know. And this instruction set architecture of this CPU is not uh, VMX compatible. So they just invented basically a new instruction set architecture, which is really completely new. So you have to relearn everything. That's not very nice, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And it has a fixed length. That's also a strict risk approach of this architecture. And yeah, 21 million transistors. That's not being very interesting. But we see that's the storage, the local storage. And that's the calculation, uh, calculation entity. And we see quite a lot of storage. And the register file is also quite huge. And we see why. Oh, not on this slide. Um, it's as I said, it's, uh, as I told you, it's a very, very, very simple processor. So it has no branch prediction or scheduling software. That's all which was achieved in the last years in processor design was branch prediction, scheduling, and out of order execution. And they throw it out because they want to get very, very high clock frequencies, and they want to move the complexity into software. They just going a totally different way to move the complexity up and to let the compiler or the, actually the programmer decide how, uh, how fast the code will run on the processor. And we have two independent, short, very short, and simple pipelines. I don't know about the, uh, the real pipeline death, but maybe you can help me. No? It's, it's maybe not published yet, I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes, a, a very short one. Um, and we can issue inside these uh, two independent pipelines two instructions in parallel. That's also very interesting because it supports overlapping of memory fetches with uh, calculations. And that's a very cool feature. Basically, every processor has it, but it's explicitly mentioned here. And we can do one memory and one SIMD computation. Basically, every computation inside the PPE is an SEMD computation, so you can you, you're operating all the time on vectors. So it's, it's a vector CPU. It's strictly in order. So yeah, they, they can't pass each other the, um, execu uh, the instructions. And they all work with a 128-bit compound data. So compound data means that it can be a vector of four 32-bit integers or four 32-bit single precision floating point or two 64-bit double precision floating point, or some, something else. So like the normal data types we all know. We can process four single precision floating point um, operations per cycle. So it's, it's pipelined, of course. Yeah. We have a latency of the pipeline death. And they are not fully, uh, fully IEEE compliant. So that's more or less for the scientific community. Because some uh, scientific programs re rely on these special IEEE features, like not a number or special rounding features. And, but I, I think it's not very important for the task of the uh, PlayStation, uh, no, not PlayStation, for the task of the cell processor to uh, just process multimedia data. Because, yeah, multimedia data is, is not very demanding in, in number accuracy or something. It doesn't matter if the pixels is a little bit. There's a little bit different color or something. It's, you just don't see it. And we see we have uh, four single point, uh, single precision floating points per cycle. We assume four gigahertz. Then we have um, 16 
um, gigaflop. And then we have this magic IBM fused multiply add instruction, which is uh, basically doing uh, multiply and add in parallel, so in, in one cycle. And we achieve 32 gigaflops. So this uh, fused multiply add instruction is, uh, is something. Yeah, I think it was designed for the uh, uh, for the top 500 list just to <laughs> to push the systems up. Sorry, IBM, but um, but we've made several investigations that it's really very, very, very useful for scientific programs, and that's that's it. So. I don't know how useful it will be for designing um, yeah, multimedia or streaming applications, but for scientific programs, it's a very useful uh, command. Then we have a very, unfortunately, a very slow double precision arithmetic, which is nearly fully IEEE compliant, and it's quite slow. And it's also not fully pipelined, and there's also another restriction. You can read everything in the programmer's manual, which is quite uh, thick, I, I think. 200 pages or no 600 pages and yeah for example the after issuing a double precision command or instruction to the processor the next uh, six clock cycles no instruction can be issued so it's just blocked for six clock cycles and so they, they can't give you a direct direct number for the gigaflops because it depends how, how, the, how other instructions are going to the pipeline and because of this blocking. Um, yes, and we can process, of course, for integers per cycle. That's just the normal vector processing approach. And that's a, a block diagram of the um, SPU. We have the local storage. It's 265 kilobyte. That's all RAM we have for our programs. So we have to write very small programs. We can fetch more uh, we can access the whole system memory through DMA, but basically we have to stick with this 256 kilobyte. And the instructions are also inside the 256 kilobyte. We have this two-way issue, even and odd pipeline. Um, both pipelines operating on these 128 registers and yeah, doing all this stuff. So interesting is the um, distinction between calculating pipeline and memory fetching pipeline. So they're operating in parallel, of course, there would be no pipeline. And we can f uh, double buffer very, very efficiently with these processors. We can fetch an instruction and calculate the next one. Uh, no, we can calculate an instruction and fetch the next data item, for example, then swap buffers, calculate data the data item from the previous fetch and fetch the next one. So that's a very interesting principle in scientific computing, just to overlap computation with the data fetching and you achieve nearly 100% of the, the theoretical peak because you don't stall at memory uh, fetches. Yeah, the memory can be accessed in 128-bit 20 28 bit lines. Yeah, that's not very... <laughs> that's going to uh, that's optimized for uh, bulk transfers. And interesting is also registers are layout. There's no distinction between, uh, for example, floating point registers or general purpose registers. Everything can fit into a register as it is a, a vector data type. So floating point data and integer data are residing in these same registers, basically. And we have no virtual memory or no coherency on the local storage. Um, we have no processing in main memory, so we have to fetch the data item into our local storage. And even more, we are also not allowed to, uh, we cannot process on the local storage, so we have to fetch the data item into the registers because it's, it's a risk design. It's a strictly, it's a strict load store architecture, as we all know. Um, then, yeah, the DMA I already told this. Um, the MFC, basically the memory flow controller, um, connects to the EIB and does some additional tasks like the MMU in the traditional, in our traditional x86 architecture does. Um, so it's a, it holds a small page table. And well, this is going to be a little bit more complicated because it has no access to the global page table. So the basically the PPE has to tell the SPU which for the actual running process which pages it's going to access. But that's, that's a programming detail, it doesn't matter here. And it does synchronization. Because we have a parallel system, 
basically we have a parallel system on a chip and we have to synchronize between these uh, tasks, yeah, units. Okay, how are we going to program it? Um, Typically, we are going to spawn user-level threads. So we just run a program. It starts at the at the uh, PPE, and then it spawns off a thread on the SPE. So, yeah, the, the thread is, is not like a, a normal thread like we know because it has a different binary. They have a different instruction set, so we need different binaries. So we just tell the SP uh, the PPE to load a binary into the local storage of some SPE, and then the SPE to execute it. That's how it works, and we have a, uh, that's, that's going to be very complicated. I, I tried to program it, and yeah, that's, that's awful at the beginning, but IBM is very kind and gives us an IDL tool. It's called Interface Description Language, and it supports RPC programming. So basically, we can define a small function, which is going to be on the SPU, and which we are going to offload, and it's, yeah, we just use this IDL tool and it does everything for us. It defines the interface, it cares for the uh, loading of the uh, instructions to uh, instructions and data to the PP, PPU, no, not PPU, of course not, SPE, sorry. And it, it starts, it triggers the SPE to, to execute the program and gets all the data back to us. That's very, very nice, but also a little bit limited. I'll, I'll show you when I have time. Um, we can do, of course, assembler programming and also C and C++ programming. Um, we are provided with uh, several C and C++ intrinsic functions. That's very nice. So we don't have to, to use the, um, um, uh, the assembler, inline assembler, to, to use the special features of the SPU. We just have functions like SPU add, SPU mul, SPU diff, which acts on vectors, vector data types. So we have new data types. We just pack your data in, and yeah, I'll show you a program later on. And we have no access to the system control table, I told you. Um, and the local storage is unprotected and untranslated, so we, we can't implement an operating system inside a SPE, for example. So we can, but it's going to be hard. Um, it's a strict load store architecture. Yeah, okay, I told it. So, that just a small comparison. This is the Opteron floor plan. It's about 114 square millimeters. It can it runs at three gigahertz, for example, and can issue two, flo or can finish two floating floating point operations per cycle. Okay, I'm talking of single precision, and the SPE is, is down here, and it's also it's running at four gigahertz and can uh, finish four single point floating precision uh, floating point per cycle. So we see it's really fast, and the Opteron is not a bad processor. But if we, if we would compare the double precision, the Opteron would be much better, but I just wanted to show something that's really amazing. And we have eight of them. Yeah, you have to remember, we have eight SPEs, and all connected with the element interconnect bus. <laughs> that's the thing in the middle, which is yeah, connected to all entities of the, um, of the cell processor. It has four 128-bit wide concentric rings, so the data is just passing around in a ring, and we can transfer 96 bytes per cycle. So you should just uh, try to calculate which data rate we have. So basically, four gigahertz, and it's it's nearly 400 uh, gigabyte per second we can transfer on this bus. And it's very interesting that it's a buffered point-to-point -point ring. So everything is independent. It's, it's, it's not really a bus, it's more a ring than a bus. So if you know SCI, you just send an item to the next entity and it stores it and sends it to the next if it's not for the entity itself. And yeah, so we have, a, for example, also a guaranteed bandwidth because I can just take my slot when I want it because I'm going to forward the data for others and, and it's just up to me if, if I want to take my slot, I take it. And the SPE, better to say the, the MFC, so the memory flow controller, uh, has the duty to, to route the traffic. So it's also very, very scalable. We can add more SPEs as we want, just the latency to reach another SPE increases. 
but we will see that it's that there are very very efficient ways to overlap, and so we can see that this latency is is not being so important. Um, and we have this guaranteed bandwidth with ma which makes it uh, real time capable. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a shift register. It's it's not like token ring. It's it's like yeah, you you put from one entity to the next entity and it copies it to the next and so on. Yes. Yes, this 96 bits okay. have to uh, shift it in one cycle from one entity to the to another. And th that's a very nice feature, I think. So, the flex IO it's just to yeah communicate with the outer world it's also because yeah if, if you're a computer scientist in supercomputing one processor is not cool you need at least 1000 and therefore you need a flex io to yeah to interconnect the processors for example directly or, indir or indirectly with the network um we have very fast connection so it's just 60 and 96 pairs in the hole is just Im uh, important as you see how many pins a processor must have at least uh, several uh, for the uh, voltage and at least these 96 pairs to communicate with the mainboard. And we have seven lanes with 44.8 gigabyte per second outgoing and five lanes with 32 gigabyte per second incoming. So it's a real cool network, I think. And also very nice is that we can connect two processors glueless. So while designing the cell, they just were designing a dual cell in the, in the same thinking. So just you put two, two cells together and you have a dual pro processor with no cost. You just can add them. It's a little bit like the Opteron here I've written. It's comparable to hypertransport. You have coherent and non-coherent links. Basically, of coherent links, you can build a CC NUMA architecture, and it's going to, to be more and more interesting. There's the first dual cell blade available, uh, available from Mercury Systems, which just put two cells together without a switch, because they can connect it gluelessly. And you, you, you can just put four or eight or more, and you just need a switch on the system. It's like a normal network, I think. It's, it's not published much, but I think it's like a normal network. So then we have a memory interface con controller just to access yeah, some more memory than our 20, 100, uh, 256 kilobyte. Um, that's connected, of course, to XDR. Um, also, just look at the number here. I don't have to say anything else. It's 25 gigabyte per second. And funny thing is, why is ECC protected? So it's designed in the uh, cell documents as ECC protected memory. Maybe IBM is going to use it as a server because I think ECC, yeah, everybody knows ECC is not very important for PlayStation or maybe, yeah, HDTV where one pixel will shift if some radiation comes. But for a server, it's very important. And yes, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe somebody can tell me at the end of the talk. Um, so they have a conventional protection system, I already told you. They use virtual addresses and they have no cache. So the memory is not cached. Only the PPE is a cache and the rest of the system is uncached. Um, what is going to be different in the programming of the cell? So we are not programming at an abstract model like the x86. In the x86, we are programming a abstract language. So like, the, like it was designed decades ago to support some very old processors and, and everybody just keeps it up, keeps it alive due to compatibility reasons, just not to lose any customers. And it's going to be difficult, of course, I'll show you. And we have the same problems as multi-core because we have to parallelize. We have to think about this, how to parallelize our code, not the compilers doing it, not implicit instruction parallelism. It's just we have to think about everything. And yeah, assembly is available, of course. We are programming it directly. We can program in C. I already told this. Um, we can virtualize the SPEs in the op operating system. That's also very interesting. So the SPE, uh, th sorry, the operating system is allocating the SPEs for a specific task. Um, a Linux version is already available 
which is doing this. It's very nice. And PPE code is usually PowerPC uh, compliant, and Linux was running without any modifications, but it, it wasn't able to use the SPEs, of course. So there, there were modifications done to the Linux kernel to use the SPEs, and I think IBM is trying to push it into the mainline kernel, so I think they're quite successful. Um, the SPE code must be self-contained. It's also very, very interesting. So that's like a small, the SPE code is basically a small program which is runnable without anything else. So you just can put it on this small SPE and it, it runs and yeah, it processes. And an auto-vectorizing compiler is available from IBM called Octopiler. But I don't think that it's going that good because I, I, didn't, I didn't try it to be honest. But I think there's no auto-vectorizing compiler yet, which is working better than a human optimizing some code. So basically, all these uh, PlayStations and, and PlayStation games are, in my opinion, programmed by hand and optimized by hand and as written mainly in assembler. So I hope you're also going to do this. So I'm, I'm giving this talk that you're going to develop cell programs, you're going to port John to sell, or maybe other very interesting programs um, with these programming models, of course. So it's just what you can think of. Job queue to NQ multiple jobs. You can build a self-multitasking SPE, but I don't know if it's, it's going to be very useful. But you can make stream processing, of course. Stream processing is very, very important for uh, managing these uh, decoding video streams and displaying HDTV and playing video games and all this stuff. And OK, for video games, it's not that important because you need to react very fast. Uh, you can implement a software-managed cache. It's also very interesting. And maybe MPI. But that's more personal thing for me, MPI. I discussed the <laughs> a uh, long time with the uh, IBM guys which prefer the shared memory model, but we'll see. So, summary and conclusion. What can we do with the cell processor? Why am, why am I here? I'm just here to tell you about the new processor generation which is going to come and to encourage you to look at the cell, look at the, um, um, look at the simulator and see the power which is behind it. So program your applications like very, very cool demo applications or something which are running, which are going to be run very fast on the uh, uh, cell processor or, yeah, something else. Um, the PlayStation 3 is coming out or maybe not, uh, we'll see. It should, become, uh, it should come out this uh, spring, but I think it's, it's very, very short. To, for Sony, and it's, it's very tough for Sony to, to get it working until spring. And they told that it's going to be at only at 3.2 gigahertz. Uh, that's not very nice. And it, it's going even worse, because they say we have only seven SPEs to the programmers which are programming the video games. And that's very interesting, because Nobody knows why. The first idea was, okay, they are trying to, to increase the production yield. So they are just switching off broken SPEs like uh, Intel or AMD does for, with, and, and sells them like a cheaper one. But then some deliberations came up that, okay, the production yields are going to be very, very high because the production started yet. I, I think it's the, the cell processors in production and the, the ramp up phase, how it's called for a, a microprocessing um, company, is, is going to be finished soon. And yeah, then the yield, they could just enable all eight SPEs. But maybe they're using an SPE for a dedicated rootkit or something. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not sure. Because this is, uh, it's Sony, it's Sony. Sony is selling the PlayStation, Sony is programming the PlayStation, and Sony is programming the operating system for the PlayStation. Um, this Ken Kuduragi told us that we are going to expect uh, a Linux version, like for the PlayStation 2. So I'm, I'm very, very interested in this version, and I, <laughs> I would be very happy to see this. But if it doesn't come, then I hope we can manage it to put a Linux on this box. So the second thing, the second application is uh, server applications. So IBM, basically a good friend maybe, Mercury, 
thinks that these cell processors is very, very, very mighty and it's very good on uh, server applications uh, and servers in general. So they sell a, a, yeah, a blade server, which is compatible to the uh, usual IBM blade sender with two S cell processors. Fortunately, they have eight SPEs enabled. So another evidence for the rootkit. And it's running Linux, of course. And yeah, more applications, just find it. So, how much time do I have left? Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I just skip it. Very interesting is that we could beat the world's fastest supercomputer with 131,000 processors with just 14,000 cell processors with dual precision. With single precision, we would just need 1,400. So, you see. You see, but, uh, but unfortunately, this top 500 list, which is uh, uh, ranking these processors, is dual precision. So they just give the problem for dual precision. But you see this. And it's, it's really going to be a very cheap, I've, I've heard about 100 something dollar, I'm not sure, a very cheap processor, which is extremely fast. So you have 256 gigaflop versus six, four on today's current processors. Okay, and so on. And now I'm going to show you the practical, more or less practical demonstration. So I hope it's going to work because, oops, oh, I have a mouse. Basically, IBM is providing a cell simulator. I'm going to start it right now. It's a, it's a real cool thing because it simulates the whole cell processor with all SPEs and it runs Linux. And it runs on a Linux, I, I think only. So, this is basically the console of the cell processor. This is the cell processor itself. I, I think I can raise the, uh, the font a little bit. Oh God. Yeah, this, missed, uh, this arrow is coming every time. So we see, <laughs> <laughs> just ignore it. We see uh, is two PPEs. So it's a dual cell, or it's a, it's a cell with at least two PPEs and seven SPEs. I don't know where the other uh, eight, sorry. I don't know where the other eight SPEs are gone, but yes. Basically, it works in the following. You can just, oh fuck, my start button is gone. So <laughs> there should be a start button, but I think I should go down again with a sorry for this. So now we have start we have a fast mode that's very interesting. So the, the fast mode enables or disables everything which is related to uh tracing the code. So timing, information and all this stuff, and it's really going ten times faster than the normal thing, um the, the normal simulation. So and you have to see, it's, it's on my very, very slow notebook. It's only a Pentium system. And it's booting up uh, Linux it's on the cell. On the cell. Yeah. This, is, this is the uh, cell console output. And it's booting up a Fedora core, yeah. But, and, and, and another interesting thing is that they, on the web page, they say that, OK, it's just install it under Fedora core. But, this is Gen 2, my notebook, because I don't like Fedora. Um, you can just copy all the libs from the Fedora system to, the, uh, to the, uh, any, any system else which is running a Linux kernel, and it works. So this is basically our cell. And the first thing I'm going to do in cool systems is this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we see. Broadband engine. Oh, two gigahertz, cool. That's a very fast thing I have here. And yes, so uh, that's the, the IBM code name. IBM basically uh, calls the uh, cell processor cell broadband engine, so CBE. And yeah, running, running with two of them on the simulator. And now I think I'm going very short. I have a small test program, which I'm going, which I will just compile. Okay, it is compiled. And I, I, I'll describe it later because um, 
because it takes very long to simulate. And there's also a very nice feature to interoperate inter between these two systems. There's a utility called call through, and you can just copy anything from the host processor to the uh, simulated system. Oh shit. Oh yeah, source. So you see I have two binaries. One SPU S dot and one PPU S dot. So one for the SPU and one for the PPU. I am making them executable and starting the PPU S dot. And now it begins simulating, 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 and it takes quite a long time, I think five minutes. And in, inside, in this time frame, I'll just show you the source code. So the PPUS.c is a very, very, very simple program. It's in main, of course. And then we have one big array, which is going to be calculated. A timing function, a timing function, and between the timing functions and call to s dot. That's a, a, a dummy calcul, uh, a dummy scientific function. Then we have another get time of day, a timing function, timing function, and an s dot spu, and idl join s dot spu. So that's generated by the idl language, the interface description language. That's really cool because you don't have to care for anything. You just program this s.spu, call the IDL to generate you stop code, and you, you can use it like, like a thread or something. And then the second example is using two threads. So it calls the s.spu with the half of the data set. So the first parameter, where is it? Here, is here n and here n half, and with another offset, of course, and it joins the two threads. So it should be, yeah, twice as fast. Now I am going to show you the SPU S dot, dot C. It has to be a separate file because it's going to be a separate binary. Oh, sorry, I forgot something. So the PPU uh, function is basically this one, which is calculate the normal S dot function. Uh, we have the array with four for loops, four cascaded for loops, just to demonstrate a high load, and it's multiplied with a scalar. So Everything is running from zero to n, and now I'm going to show you the. Oh. Very fast. I'm going to show you the SPU code. So it's basically the same, but I have the. Sorry. <laughs> I have uh, the vector. So I divide n by four and do this SPU mole, multiplying the, ah, multiplying the vector with the uh, scalar. So it's just processing four things at one time, at one clock, and we see, oh fuck, there's a, a small mistake in the timing function of the uh, simulator, I think. So this should take about four times this, sorry. <laughs> Usually it does this, but if I do something else on the notebook, if I just set it on the load, then it, it behaves like strange. Uh, I, th I think it's my mistake because I'm using the normal get time of day function for uh, assessing the time. I should use something for the power processor to get clock cycles or this thing. But you have to believe me, if I would start it a second time, but we don't have time, um, we would see here 160,000, then 40,000, and then the next simulation is still running. So we are seeing here the SPEs, which are assigned. Uh, SPE 6 and 7 is assigned. I, it's going to assign another SPE. But I think I'm going to finish now, because they're looking angry. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Thank, thank you, everybody, for coming. And <laughs>